For the 70% of community college students who are working while enrolled, I think that is a prime opportunity to show that students are engaging in experiences outside of the classroom, that there is you know, immediate opportunity for community colleges to award credit for that. This is In the Know with ACCT, the voice of community college leaders. I'm Jacob Bray. On this episode of In the Know, ACCT's Director of Strategic Communications, David Connor, talks with me and Allison Beer, ACCT's Senior Policy Analyst, about the paper we just published about prior learning assessments. We dive into why we chose to profile Dallas County Community College District and Eastern West Virginia Community and Technical College and the benefits of prior learning assessments generally. Today... Uh, I'm here with Jacob and Allison, the co-authors of ACCT's newest paper. It's called Make It Count. Uh, And this paper is about bridging students' academic and work experiences uh, to advance community college uh, workforce development strategies. So I think, um, you know, basically the focus of this paper is on prior learning assessments. It's not necessarily a new thing, uh, but I think you guys approached it from a slightly different angle this time. So my first uh, big question is, why did you decide to address this topic now? Well, like you said, prior learning's been going on for a while, um, at least 80 years. There's been some form of credit for prior, prior learning. But now what we're looking at in this report is specifically how prior learning fits into uh, workforce, general workforce strategy at community colleges. Hey, and I think you know, going off of that, there have been a lot of conversations about what students community colleges are serving. Our last report looked at working students in particular, students with other life experiences, such as veterans or people who have worked in other fields. And we really wanted to make the connection here that if that's the student body that community colleges are serving, then we need to be making um, extra efforts to figure out how to count their work and academic experiences um, that go towards attaining a credential and moving forward in their career goals. So could you talk a little bit more about the um, the veterans component? I know that there's some, um, you know, a lot, a lot of veterans, probably all veterans, acquire a lot of specific skills during their time in the military. Um, how does that factor into prior learning and how significant of a share of, of this big picture is it? Well, f- first of all, 5% of community college students are veterans, which may not sound like a huge number, but that's thousands and thousands and thousands of students spread across a uh, thousand plus community colleges. And what makes veterans unique is many of them are leaving service with a wide variety of skills that have applications in the non-military workforce. Right. You know, like Jacob said, veterans are bringing in experience from their military training that can translate into a degree or into civilian work. Um, But what we see from past data is that veterans are more likely to hold um, non-degree credentials and have opportunities to advance towards associate degrees or maybe eventually to a bachelor's degree um, and incorporating all of their different acumen from their military experience can help propel that process for them. So the report overall has three major takeaways um, that have been outlined in, um, for example, in the press release that went out today. And also you created profiles of two different programs at two community colleges. So if we could just talk through briefly each of the three takeaways and then those uh, college-based programs, um, I think people would be interested to hear about those components specifically. The first takeaway that you've identified is that um, the nearly 70% of community college students who work while they're enrolled, and the 50% of community college students who are age 25 and older could benefit from prior learning assessment credits for their work experiences outside of the classroom. Um, what What is encompassed within that takeaway? Sure. Um, so for the 70% of community college students who are working while enrolled, I think that is a prime opportunity to show that students are engaging in experiences outside of the classroom, that there is you know, immediate opportunity for community colleges to award credit for that, um, especially you know, something we highlighted in our last paper on working students was that many of these students 
the work that they're holding is not directly related to their college coursework. It's primarily seen as a financial necessity. And so we are highlighting the process of prior learning assessments as one tool that colleges can use to you know, help remedy that challenge that students are having and making sure that they know that their work experience can count to their degree attainment. For the students who are 25 and older who make up a large portion of community colleges, there's also a greater likelihood that these older students are coming into their academic experience with prior work or prior academics, whether that be in different credential programs or boot camps, um, past community college experience, et cetera. So there's an opportunity to, for the colleges to find out what other experiences these older students are bringing to the table and how that applies to their current um, course of study. The use of prior learning assessments has expanded through federal and state policies that encourage uh, colleges to bridge students' academic and work experiences. Uh, in, in the paper, you've identified two different programs, the Federal Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Program, uh, which uses the abbreviation T-A-A-C-C-C-T. It's not the most creative one that they've come <laughs> up with on the Hill. Um, and another one called the Educational Quality Through Innovative Partnerships Pilot or EQIP. Uh, can you talk about those programs and how they relate to these these prior learning assessments? So we chose to highlight these two particular policies and programs um, because though they weren't specifically about prior learning assessments, both of them included strategies as part of the overall goal. So in the TAC program, which was a grant program specifically for community colleges to strengthen workforce development, so through the TAC program, it was strongly encouraged that grantees consider prior learning assessments as a specific tool to help um, community college students returning to education bridge some of their prior learning experience and really advance in their careers. Um, through the EQIP program, this was a program that's more known for uh, supporting colleges work with what we call non-traditional educational providers, so you know, such as boot camp providers or other online learning. And prior learning was woven into that program as a tool to take the learning that's happening in this non-traditional environment and translate that to the community college experience. Like I said, again, both of these programs really had uh, a focus on doing this for the purpose of workforce development. And Allison, you might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the majority of uh, grant awardees for both of these programs, uh, a, ma a majority of them incorporated PLA in their proposals in some fashion. Right. For the TAC grant in particular, you know, which received... Um, a large amount of grant applications, PLA was in the majority of those. And we know that through uh, an analysis that was done by, uh, the New by New America. So you're um, discussing the TAC grant in past tense. Are both of these programs, uh, are, are they in the past or are they currently active? Uh, so these are programs that there are colleges that still have money under operating, but they're not you know, current government programs. So okay. that's why we refer to them in the past tense. But there's still opportunity to incorporate PLA into new or existing workforce development. So the third and final takeaway from, from this report is that community colleges can use prior learning assessments to strengthen business partnerships. Uh, talk about that. Talk about how these can help colleges, you know, work with businesses in their areas. We saw that through some of the through the two profiles we did at uh, Dallas County Community College District. We saw that uh, that Dallas has a lot of employers who need employees, and in order to fill that gap, uh, they partnered with a third party educator called Straighter Line. And the reason they developed that partnership was because. Uh, DCCCD recognized that they had a weakness in pitching directly to the business community, but Straighter Line could come in and fill that gap and offer offer courses to students at a reduced rate that are guaranteed to transfer to DCCCD and beyond because they want uh, many of these students to eventually transfer to four-year uh, institutions as well. So they're guaranteed to have 
uh, to earn credit from these classes that they're taking through Strader Line, which is how PLA weaves in. Mm -hmm. And at Eastern West Virginia Community and Technical College, they've had success in going directly to employers uh, to talk to prospective students, uh, places like on their lunch break at work. I think it's you know, the impetus for using PLA to strengthen community college and business partnerships is twofold. You know, the first, like Jacob was saying, employers want um, employees with college credentials. And so anything that they can do to accelerate that process for students is going to be beneficial for the employer and the student. I also think that we see that community, that businesses are offering more and more of their own employee training or looking for these third-party educational providers to provide training directly to employees. And using PLA is a way for to take that training that's happening out of the community college setting and translate it to um, a degree or a credential for the student. So Included among all of the information in this paper are two examples of prior learning assessment initiatives at Eastern West Virginia Community and Technical College and Dallas County Community College District. Could you talk about each one of those colleges, why, how and why you identified those colleges and their specific programs and what uh, practical takeaways can be um, garnered from those? Sure. So with Dallas, like uh, I mentioned earlier, we saw the partnership with Strader Line and thought that would be a good uh, a good profile to include because they're working with a third party educator, which is somewhat uncommon, um, and they're working with them because it gives them a competitive advantage. Um, both Dallas Community Col Dallas County Community College District and uh, the students um, because they can get these courses at uh, an affordable rate and they can also know that those courses are going to transfer um, not and not just to DCCCD but also to four-year institutions mm -hmm. and the reason we wanted to look at Eastern West Virginia Community and Technical College is because they're really trying to um, overhaul their state policy to make their PLA programs more efficient for students so prior to this effort, each institution in West Virginia had its own PLA policy, but they, they realized that was, like I said, inefficient for students, and they wanted to uh, create a more unified program. So they developed uh, what they call a Board of Governors degree, which allows students to uh, come in with PLA credit either through the use of a portfolio or through uh, transferring individual credits um, which Eastern West Virginia tried to encourage by waiving the uh, fee um, for credits that are converted. Mm -hmm. And with this Board of Governors degree, that allows, uh, that allows students to take those PLA credits and more efficiently turn them into an uh, associate's degree, which also has uh, different focuses, sort of similar to majors at a mm -hmm. four-year institution that allows students to uh, specialize. So actually what you said just reminded me of something uh, personal. Way back when I was in college, I went to Northern Virginia Community College and then I transferred to George Mason University. And uh, toward the end of my education, I was told, oh, you know, typically in your freshman year, you would have taken a six credit class as an English major. That's a requirement. It's a fundamental class for graduating with an English degree. And since I spent my first two years at Northern Virginia Community College, um, I wasn't ever a freshman. And so that was saved for my last semester. And my counselor told me that I could actually take an exam and potentially test out of it, be awarded those credits without having to pay for them and not have to spend the time. And um, the reason I mention that is because Honestly, had I had to pay, even if I had uh, tested, uh, you know, to, to be awarded the credits, but if I had to pay for them, I think I, as a student in that mindset, I would have thought this is some kind of scam or something. And I think it really says a lot and could do have a real reputational value to be able to provide these services to students without costing them anything. It can actually accelerate their time to receiving their degree, and it can make them feel like, you know, this college has my back. It supported me. It helped me get through 
So I, I just thought I'd throw that little anecdote out because I think some students may feel that way. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the reason that uh, Eastern West Virginia is going to employers and, stalking, and talking to students on site because they can say, you know, look, you guys have all these uh, skills. You know, say you've been working in a machine shop. Uh, you have all these skills that can immediately be converted into credit, college credit for free. And you'll be, you know, this much closer to having an advanced degree that, you know, can increase your earnings by a pretty substantial number. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's a real value and actually something worth promoting if your college does this. Because um, I, know, I, I know plenty of people who would feel uh, attracted to a program that would award them credits for things that they already know. Yeah. So this, um, as we know, that this is one in a series of papers that you're developing with support from Guardian Life Insurance Company, um, which is also one of our corporate council members. And we really appreciate their support for making this type of work possible. You mentioned something earlier, Allison, about a prior paper uh, that addresses, as one recommendation, uh, aligning studies uh, with uh, work, you know, so that so that they're actually compatible, and so that students are getting um, getting practical experience that aligns with their studies, so that they basically aren't working a part-time hourly job that doesn't relate in any way. And by the time they graduate, they'll be better equipped to get into the working world. So what stands out to me is that these two papers uh, exist in isolation, but the recommendations are compatible. They could be stacked theoretically to help improve a student's progress at college. So um, is there anything that you would like to say about the prior papers for people who may have missed them when we released them, Partnerships for a Future Ready Workforce and the College Work Balancing Act? Sure, I think, but I think that is a good um, insight that you have pointing out that a lot of the recommendations in these papers are similar, can be stacked, and that really is the intention to, the first report that we released, Partnerships for a Future Ready Workforce, looked broadly at workforce development trends and how that's changing in light of automation and new technology and just the realities for students today. For each of these subsequent papers, we want to take a deeper dive into a more specific issue. So like you mentioned, the last paper working on working students, this paper talking about how to use prior learning assessments, and then our next two reports, which will focus on upskilling and automation. But I think that the timing theme for all of those is how do you improve a student's experience. So like you said, that their college coursework is tied to their career goals. Um, and you know, you will see a lot of overlap and um, we're really just trying to take a look at these issues from different angles so colleges can find uh, different strategies that work for them. Yeah, I mean, there are a ton of things that go into uh... An effective overall strategy for students, making sure they can efficiently move through the process, making sure they're uh, enrolled in degree programs that will get them jobs after they graduate, making sure that the classes that they're taking while they're at community colleges will transfer to four-year institutions. And um, yeah, yeah, that's that's what uh, all these papers do. So you know, it, it may seem like there are redundancies, but they they really there really aren't. Yeah, I, I certainly don't see them as redundancies, particularly because they're being issued in, um, <clears throat> you know, in installments. Also, um, ACCT's magazine, Trustee Quarterly, highlights findings from these as well as other profiles. So uh, what I would say to people who are listening is if you missed any of these papers, be sure to look them up. They're all on our website, acct.org. We've been told by a number of our members that they actually add these types of reports as they come out to their board agendas so that their board will have an opportunity to discuss uh, particularly the profiles and see if there's a way to use those as models at their own colleges. So these are the sorts of tools that we're, um, we're trying to offer to members so that they can be of use to you. If your college does anything uh, with prior learning assessments or with any of the other issues that Allison and Jacob have talked about, uh, we would love it if you'd get in touch and share that information with us. We would be happy to share those with our members through our different avenues. Um, Jacob, is there anything that you would want to say too about some of those? 
Well, I would say especially if you have information regarding uh, upskilling programs uh, or automation programs on your campus. Those are the next two reports that we're releasing, the first one being upskilling and the second one being automation. So, yeah, we would love to, love to hear what you've got. Good. Yeah. So this, the, you know, the reason that we do this is to share information with our members, but also to uh, solicit in information from members and just find practices that will work well for a lot of different institutions with student success in mind. The end. <laughs> If you want to check out the full report, and we recommend that you do, it's available at www.acct.org slash publications. We'll also link it in the description for this episode. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.